I think Jefferson's a very interesting character in that he has all these really ambitious goals, but he also hates conflict. And at the same time, he likes technology, right? And, and so when I was, I was thinking, trying to come up with titles, uh, in many ways, William Henry Harrison becomes sort of the perfect tool for Jefferson to wield when it comes to Indian policy out on the frontier, because uh, basically Harrison's willing to do the dirty work that uh, is going to uh, get Jefferson what he wants. Uh, lots of Indian land purchased very quickly and very cheaply. Um, Harrison, I, I think he's probably more interesting for the fact that he's so typical uh, rather than, than unusual. He's uh, the son of a, you know, sort of a grand Virginia family. Uh, his father had signed the Declaration of Independence. And so he, he has this sort of uh, inherent leadership sort of instilled in him. And yet at the same time, uh, like a lot of those big Virginia planter families, they've kind of sort of hit hard times after the American Revolution. And so Harrison basically, you know, he has you know, the, the characterization of being this sort of uh, big plantation leader, but he doesn't have the money to back it up. And so, like an entire generation, he's going to seek his fortune in uh, the West. He initially starts out uh, as, as a teenager. He goes to medical school and, and pretty quickly decides he doesn't care for that. And then he joins the army, which he actually likes a lot. Uh, and he loves soldiering. But uh, as he gets into his early 20s and he marries, uh, marries a woman named Anna Sims, whose father was a big land speculator and a judge, and he finds that, uh, particularly as his family grows, uh, the army paycheck just isn't cutting it, even as he gets promoted to captain. And so uh, basically, you know, it, it's sort of a, for him, it, it seems the perfect solution to go into a political career. Uh, he gets status and power and influence, and also hopefully a steady paycheck. What's the first major political office that he held? Uh, he's secretary of the Northwest Territory. Uh, which he's, and in many cases, uh, the actual governor at the time, a guy named Arthur Sinclair, was gone a lot. And so Harrison ends up doing, uh, he's basically the de facto governor of a large territory north of the Ohio. Uh, and then uh, he is uh, where he really starts getting some notice. He is elected um, territories at that time. They didn't get a voting member of Congress, but they did get a representative. And Harrison uh, becomes the Northwest Territories representative in Congress. And this really allows him a year or two to hobnob uh, and, and sort of lobby people and also make connections. Uh, and, you know, the fact that he has a good family name, this is again a classic Virginia family of, of leaders, uh, that really sort of helps uh, sort of bring him into uh, the, the public eye and particularly for people who have power and influence. Uh, and then, uh, towards the very end of John Adams's presidency, uh, they uh, carve off part of the Northwest Territory into what's going to eventually become the state of Ohio, and they create a new territory, Indiana. And John Adams needs an experienced hand, somebody he can trust, to administer that territory. Uh, and he picks William Henry Harrison. After um, John Adams says he wants to appoint William Henry Harrison. It's already become clear that uh, Jefferson is going to be the next president. And Harrison, showing uh, you know uh, some some good political sense, uh, sends feelers out to Jefferson saying, "Hey, are you going to kick me out of office immediately?" Uh, and when he learns that Jefferson isn't going to do that, uh, he he then agrees to take the job as governor of Indiana. So the first year year and a half uh, in Indiana, this would be from you know probably. Um, up to about 1802, there's not that much going on. But uh, in 1802, uh, rumors start swirling about that the French uh, are going to retake uh, the Louisiana Territory just west of the Mississippi River. And this basically, and of course, this is Napoleonic France, whereas before it had been held by the Spanish, who aren't particularly aggressive or even militarily competent by this point. And the idea that Napoleon might be taking over Louisiana Territory sends Jefferson into a panic. And from late 1802 uh, into 1803, he, he writes this secret uh, private letter to uh, Harrison, basically telling him to do almost anything he can to buy up uh, uh, Indian lands on the Mississippi and the Ohio River as quickly and cheaply as he can. Uh, Jefferson's idea is, and this really becomes hardened by early 1803, uh, Jefferson's idea is we want to buy up that land and get as many uh, white settlers on them as, as we can because they'll serve as a militia who are going to stop Napoleon. 
which is kind of an optimistic goal, I would argue at this point. But anyway, uh, this is when uh, he basically gives Harrison the green light uh, to sort of do what, you know, any means necessary to negotiate these treaties quickly and cheaply. Uh, what's really fascinating is, you know, within a year, the United States has actually purchased all the Louisiana territory. And so in theory, that, that desperate need for quick land acquisition is gone. And yet at the same time, uh, Jefferson really likes buying up Indian lands cheaply, and this sort of fits uh, some of his, his broader goals. And Harrison, turns out, is really, really good at this. Uh, not necessarily at doing it in a way that's going to make Indians happy, but he's very effective uh, at buying up this land quickly and cheaply. And that's the name of the game. And he basically continues in that mode. The way I usually describe it in class is I'll pick three random students and I'll get their names. Uh, and then I will, uh, I will play, of course, the part of William Henry Harrison because I'm wearing a tie. And I will pick two of the students and say, oh, hey, uh, would you mind coming to my Indian council? And I would like uh, to buy that third student's desk. Would you first two students be willing to buy the third, sell me the, the third student's desk uh, for $500 a year? And of course they say yes, because it's not their desk and they really don't care. Uh, then you invite uh, student one and student three and ask them if you could buy student number two's desk. Um, it seems sort of like a, a silly reductive exercise, but it, it's basically how these treaties worked. Uh, Harrison was very good at figuring out which Indian, tre Indian chiefs were willing to play ball with him, uh, which ones were desperate enough for some annuities and, and some other government perks, uh, that they would go basically agree to sell their neighbor's land, whether they had a decent claim to them or not. And as, as far as uh, Harrison was concerned, you know, as long as I get Indians uh, to sign on the dotted line, it's, it's, uh, it's perfectly good. And Jefferson was more than willing to accept, uh, you know, Indian treaties like that. The very early 19th century is this odd period uh, between uh, the Treaty of Greenville in 1795, which basically ended wide-scale uh, warfare north of the Ohio River. And of course, uh, William Henry Harrison was not only in the army uh, that had sort of led up to that treaty, but also at the treaty negotiations. Uh, and I would argue, and other people would argue, he got sort of a, a first-hand lesson in how to conduct Indian treaties at Greenville. Uh, and then for the next decade or so, you basically have the Indian population north of the Ohio River is in really awful straits. The Napoleonic Wars has killed the fur trading economy. Alcoholism is rampant. They are very much a dispirited, uh, defeated people. And prior to 1805, it's actually relatively easy for him to do this. Um, it's after the year 1805 when we start seeing uh, religious revivals among the Indians north of the Ohio, most famously uh, that of uh, a guy named uh, Tenskwatawa, or the Shawnee Prophet, uh, particularly when his uh, warrior brother Tecumseh gets involved. Uh, that's when Harrison actually has to sort of change tactics a bit because uh, they basically hold to the idea that no Indian should sell any land to the United States uh, under any circumstances. And that's sort of directly uh, opposite him. So he's going to have to adopt a number of tactics. Uh, he tries to win the profit over and then he sort of uh, starts seeing, well, he's a tool of the British and we have to watch out for him. Uh, but basically there isn't any real... There, there are occasional sort of flare-ups, uh, maybe threats of force, but you really don't have actual combat until late 1811, uh, which, again, most historians would probably argue, as far as the Ohio Valley goes, the War of 1812 actually starts in, in late 1811. So how long was he in this position, and then um, when did his presidential aspirations come into effect? Well, this is one of the things I... I found really interesting about him. I would argue his early career is, you know, because he's in office for about a month. Uh, he doesn't actually do uh, quite uh, a lot except cough uh, during his presidential uh, days, I guess we would say. But his earlier career, I think, is much more fascinating, and he has uh, a much greater impact on uh, American society, in particular our Western expansion and, and Western policy. I think what got me interested in William Henry Harrison was actually I started out being interested in Tecumseh, the Shawnee war chief, who eventually ends up leading uh, this confederation of Indians fighting against the United States in the War of 1812. Um, and he's, Tecumseh is one of these sort of readily made uh, heroes. And, and he actually gets sort of oddly incorporated in the pantheon of American heroes because uh, in many ways to sort of our way of thinking, he's so incredibly uh, honorable. Uh, he's, you know, he sticks by his guns. He's very principled. Uh, he fights for what he believes in. Uh, he was actually one of the, the few Native Americans who strongly uh, objected to the torture and killing of prisoners in, in time of war. So that was also seen as very honorable. So, you know, I started out in high school and college reading about Tecumseh. Uh, but then when it came time to graduate school, you know, 
there had already been uh, some really fantastic works written on Tecumseh. There wasn't a lot of meat left on the bone, if you will. Uh, whereas Harrison really hadn't received a major biographical treatment since World War II. He's in this sort of odd netherworld where he was a president, and so you would sort of naturally assume that's the most interesting part of his life, and yet he's president for such a short time. I mean, for heaven's sakes, people mo know more about Millard Fillmore's presidency than they do Harrison's. And so I, I think that's uh, part of the, the rub. Um, which is funny, it, and, and I'm not sure it necessarily had to end up that way, because if you look at the, his campaigns for the presidency, there's certainly no shortage of campaign literature and all these sort of not especially uh, unbiased biographies written of him. So there's really no reason uh, that he shouldn't have been sort of uh, more famous. Also, too, this, and people are knowing we're coming up on the, the bicentennial of the War of 1812, uh, it's probably the least known of the major early American wars. You know, for the revolution has a huge following. The Mexican War and Civil War have huge, you know, markets for their books. And the War of 1812 has been sort of slow to, uh, to sort of pick up that market and that interest, I think.